Okay, strap on your tinfoil hats for this one, because Lockheed Martin's hypersonic SR-72 is a real aircraft program that's been in active development for 17 years, and may have produced flying prototypes as early as 2017. This internally funded Lockheed Martin program was publicly disclosed for years before going dark, just at the onset of the modern hypersonic arms race. And this isn't just some harebrained conspiracy theory, this is the cold hard truth. And I brought receipts. Throughout weeks of research and interviews, I've compiled the most complete and extensive timeline of the SR-72's development ever published online. But the bottom line up front is this. I'm confident in saying that the SR-72 program is real, has produced likely at least one flying demonstrator that's been in testing for years now. And despite the secrecy surrounding this program, the Air Force might have actually given us a peek of it two years ago. So grab some snacks because this might be a long one. Let's run through the very real developmental timeline of America's hypersonic spy plane and strike aircraft that we know as the SR-72. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is a special edition of Air Power. We've discussed the SR-72 and similar hypersonic aircraft programs on this channel a handful of times before, but after new rumors surfaced that Lockheed Martin Skunk Works Division may have delivered a high-performance spy plane to the U.S. Air Force for testing, I asked on Instagram and Twitter if you'd be interested in me delving deeper into this topic for a new video, and the answer was nearly unanimous. Out of hundreds of responses, I think I got maybe two or three no's, so I have you guys to thank for this one. Because what began as a simple summary of different things I've learned about the SR-72, covering it for a variety of different news outlets over the years, quickly ballooned into an entirely new research project. As I came across new documents, press releases, interviews, and sources that I never had before. So let's start with what got me rolling down this hill recently to begin with, and that was remarks made by Vago Meridian, the editor-in-chief of the Defense and Aerospace Report, and a recent episode of his podcast. During a conversation with Teal Group senior analyst J.J. Gertler, Meridian brought up the RQ-180, which is a high-flying stealth reconnaissance aircraft that's so secretive, the U.S. government has still yet to even acknowledge its existence, despite the fact that it's been photographed a number of times in recent years. In fact, we don't even actually know what this platform is called. RQ-180 is just what we've been calling it, and it's expected to replace America's venerable U-2 spy plane, as well as the RQ-180. Q4 Global Hawk in the not too distant future. But then, Meridian brought up another aircraft, one that is even more impressive than the highly classified RQ 180. And I'll just quote him here. There is another program, however, which is for a much more capable reconnaissance aircraft that is the product of the Skunk Works, and it is a Lockheed Martin aircraft. There are articles that have already been delivered, but that there have been challenges with that program. My understanding is that the program was rescoped because it is that ambitious a capability that it required a little bit of rescoping in order to be able to get to the next block of aircraft. Now, when we're talking about highly classified special access programs fielding next generation aircraft the U.S. government has yet to even acknowledge exist, saying something was so ambitious it had to be rescoped is a pretty big deal. And to give you a bit of a spoiler for later in the video, that ambitious capability that prompted rescoping may well have to do with the fact that for the first seven years of development, Lockheed Martin was aiming to field a Mach 6 aircraft. But very shortly after they began ground testing on their combined cycle hypersonic engine, they realized that they may be able to go a whole lot faster than that. Now, if you find yourself wondering why the U.S. would even be interested in a hypersonic spy plane in this era of satellites, I actually have a whole video explaining it in depth. But suffice to say, spy satellites are not nearly as capable or omnipresent as they're often perceived to be. And as a result, 
America's defense apparatus is still heavily reliant on a wide variety of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft. In fact, many of the new drone aircraft fielded throughout the global war on terror were first and foremost ISR platforms that later had weapon systems strapped to them to increase their capability sets. And that brings us to the very beginning of the SR-72 story, which happens to coincide with the end of the SR-71s. Rumors of a faster, higher-flying replacement for the Blackbird began to emerge all the way back in the 1980s, the first time it flew into retirement, with many arguing, just as they do today, that the U.S. would not retire the SR-71 without something even better to replace it with. And while our exploration of topics like Aurora may suggest that there could have been high-speed technology demonstrators and prototypes being tested at places like Area 51, it's evident that there was not a higher-performing aircraft in service when the Blackbird flew into the sunset. The SR-71's first of two different retirements came in 1989, after what Washington Post reporter Patrick Tyler described as a bit of last-minute horse trading to apply declining defense budget resources to other Air Force and intelligence satellite programs. Put simply, the high-flying aircraft's perceived value was on the decline right alongside the defense budget that was keeping it airborne. And if you want more confirmation that a high-flying replacement didn't already exist at the time, look no further than the aircraft's revival in 1994 and subsequent retirement in 1999, followed almost immediately by another attempted revival in 2001 to support early operations in the global war on terror. If the Air Force already had an even more capable spy plane in service, they wouldn't have kept trying to drag the Blackbird out of mothballs. But don't think for a minute that Lockheed Martin didn't notice. And while they were busy supporting U-2 operations and developing secretive high-flying subsonic ISR aircraft like the RQ-170, they also started thinking about a high-flying hypersonic follow-up to the SR-71 that could pick up where it left off. And in 2006, the firm secretly began initial design work on what would become the SR-72. This new initiative was led by Lockheed Martin's hypersonic program manager, Brad Leland, and he had 20 Skunk Works engineers working under him for seven straight years in secret before Lockheed Martin let word of this effort reach the press. But that year, in 2013, they not only disclosed it, they let Leland do interviews. In Lockheed Martin's announcement press release, which they no longer host online, Leland was quoted as saying, Speed is the next aviation advancement to counter emerging threats in the next several decades. The technology would be a game changer in theater, similar to how stealth is changing the battle space today. In subsequent interviews, Leland went on to say that they could build a single-engine technology demonstrator in five to six years for under a billion dollars. Now, that statement is worth taking note of for two reasons. The first is that five to six years would place a flying demonstrator out at around 2018 or 2019. And the second is that Lockheed Martin was self-funding this effort. It began in 2006 when the U.S. government was cutting programs like the F-22 to focus on paying for the global war on terror. And a big part of this media push in 2013 was clearly oriented at trying to get some U.S. governmental buy-in. Leland went on to explain that thanks to lessons learned in previous hypersonic efforts that had been canceled, like the HTV-3X, they had already zeroed in on powering this aircraft with a turbine-based combined cycle engine, and they'd partnered with Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop one. Now, this turbine-based combined cycle engine would leverage an afterburning turbofan engine, either a Pratt & Whitney F-100 or a General Electric F-110, both engines that had already seen service in fighters like the F-15 and the F-16 by then, followed by a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet, which can't work at low speeds but comes alive at high speeds. And through the combination of these two engines, this aircraft could take off and land under turbofan power like any other tactical jet, but while flying could transition to scramjet power to achieve incredible speeds. At the time, the stated aim was Mach 6. But Leland did acknowledge that they were having trouble marrying the turbofan, which he called the turbine, with the scramjet. I'll quote him here. The turbine, which works well up to Mach 2, and the scramjet works well at Mach 4 and above. By making these work together down at Mach 3, below Mach 3, that's really the key. 
Now, in the past, we've looked very closely at Hermes's turbine-based combined cycle Chimera engine, which is an inline turbojet ramjet design. And that works because a ramjet needs a blocking body in its inlet to slow the inflowing air to subsonic speeds to make it more manageable. And Hermes uses their turbojet engine as that blocking body. But because Lockheed Martin was using a scramjet, which requires supersonic airflow, you can't have an engine mounted in the way. And instead, they used what Leland described as dual flow paths in an over-under configuration. In other words, the turbofan mounted above the scramjet. Leland went on to say that Lockheed Martin already had a very solid design for the aircraft, but that it would take an influx of cash to prove that they could marry the turbofan to the scramjet in a functional manner. And if he got his funding, Leland said they could build an F-22 Raptor-sized single-engine demonstrator, which he called a flight research vehicle, or FRV, by 2018, with a double-engine operational aircraft to follow by 2030. And this is not the last time we'll hear that timeline from Lockheed Martin officials. After the media frenzy died down, Leland and his team got back to work, and we didn't hear anything else until 2015, when the SR-72 once again drew headlines after a popular science cover story devoted to the program offered some new and maybe inaccurate details about the aircraft's progress. This new article described the turbine-based combined cycle engine in a pretty different way. Instead, now saying that it would operate in three distinct modes, first flying under turbojet power before transitioning to ramjet power and then finally to the scramjet. Turbojets, you see, are an older and different kind of air-breathing jet engine than the turbofans Leland described in 2013. But truth be told, mixing up turbofan and turbojet could very easily have just been a simple editorial error. As for having both ramjet and scramjet modes, that was probably the author's attempt at describing what a dual-mode scramjet really does. You see, a combined cycle turbofan scramjet works by having a single air inlet that leads to both the turbofan and the scramjet with a diverter, sort of like a valve that controls which of the two engines the air is flowing to. Now, you use the turbofan from a dead stop all the way up to speeds in excess of Mach 2, creeping up towards Mach 3, but at that point, you want to start transitioning to the scramjet for power. Now, scramjets don't function particularly well at these lower speeds, but a ramjet, which, as we already discussed, works a lot like a scramjet except using subsonic airflow, can. So by leaving that diverter slightly open, impeding the airflow into the scramjet, you can allow it to function like a ramjet temporarily, at least until you're going fast enough to transition to full scramjet power. And this is a design that Aerojet Rocketdyne actually helped to pioneer in their rocket-based combined cycle scramjet engines just a few years prior. But these details be damned, Lockheed Martin proudly created a page on their website dedicated solely to the SR-72 effort, with this cover story front and center, right next to the statement, a hypersonic plane does not have to be an expensive distant possibility. In fact, an SR-72 could be operational by 2030. But Lockheed Martin was not through yet, because before the end of 2015, they also released a Skunk Works promotional video with a brief computer-animated clip of their SR-72 design accompanied by the words, Global Strike. Because right from the start, this was never about just fielding a spy plane. This aircraft was always meant to deliver payloads. Now, after that, Lockheed Martin went quiet for two more years about the SR-72 program. But in 2017, we found out that Leland had gotten his funding wish. In yet another media push, Lockheed Martin announced that their combined cycle hypersonic engine had been in ground testing since 2013. In other words, right after Leland said they could begin. And now, after four years of work, they said it was mature enough to be stuck into an aircraft. I'm going to quote Lockheed Martin Executive Vice President and the General Manager of the Skunk Works at the time, Rob Weiss, from an interview he did with Aviation Week in June 2017. We've been saying hypersonics is two years away for the last 20 years, but all I can say is the technology is mature, and we, along with DARPA and the services, are working hard to get that capability in the hands of our warfighters as soon as possible. 
Weiss went on to say that the Skunk Works was, quote, getting close to beginning development on their full-scale flight research vehicle, or FRV, which he also described as a single-engine platform about the size of an F-22 Raptor. Now, he said that that would start flying in the early 2020s, with 2030 still claimed as the target for a twin-engine platform to enter operational service. But we'd soon find out that that target of the early 2020s for the flight research vehicle may have been a lie, because just a few months later, in September 2017, eyewitness reports surfaced of a scale SR-72 technology demonstrator flying over Palmdale, California. Now, if Palmdale rings a bell for you, it probably should. It's where Lockheed Martin Skunk Works is located, as well as the Air Force's highly secretive Plant 42 and Northrop Grumman's B-21 Raider effort. This is the same city we just saw the B-21 make its first test flight over. So Aviation Week looked into these reports and found them credible enough to take them to Lockheed Martin. And they got a response from LM's Executive Vice President of Aeronautics, Orlando Carvalho. Now, Carvalho did not confirm that these flights were taking place, but he also seemed to go out of his way not to deny them either. I'll quote him now. Although I can't go into specifics, let's just say the Skunk Works team in Palmdale, California is doubling down on our commitment to speed. But Carvalho didn't stop there, because he also gave us our first hint that the SR-72 program was no longer aiming for a top speed of Mach 6, and was likely aiming quite a bit higher. I'll quote him again. Hypersonics is like stealth. It's a disruptive technology that will enable various platforms to operate at two to three times the speed of the Blackbird. Security classification guidance will only allow us to say the speed is greater than Mach 5. Now, maybe this was just conversational hyperbole, but two to three times the speed of the Blackbird would be Mach 6.4 to 9.6. And things would only speed up from there, because a few months later, in January 2018, Lockheed Martin's Vice President of Strategy and Customer Requirements for Advanced Development Programs, a guy named Jack O'Banion, spoke at the SciTech Forum held by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics in Florida. Now, during this event, O'Banion projected an artist's rendering of the SR-72 on the screen behind him, and then discussed the aircraft as though it not only already existed, but had already been seeing successes in testing. I'll quote O'Banion here. Without the digital transformation, the aircraft you see there could not have been made. We couldn't have made the engine itself. It would have melted down into slag if we had tried to produce it five years ago. But now we can digitally print that engine with an incredibly sophisticated cooling system, integral to the material of the engine itself, and have that engine survive for multiple firings, for routine operation. Now this doesn't sound like the sort of remarks you'd make about a paper plane, this sounds like something in testing. So Bloomberg's Justin Bachman pressed O'Banion on his statements, and O'Banion doubled down, responding, the aircraft is also agile at hypersonic speeds with reliable engine starts. Now, short of actually getting our hands on footage of these test flights, having Lockheed Martin's executive vice president in charge of advanced programs say the aircraft was flying and agile at hypersonic speeds is about as smoking as a gun can get. But everything would change just two months later. On March 1st of 2018, Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered a speech that has since become infamous. In this speech, Putin announced that Russia was putting the world's first modern hypersonic weapons into service, starting with the KH-47 M2 Kinzel to be soon followed by the avant-garde nuclear hypersonic glide vehicle. Now, we would later learn that the Kinzel was nothing more than an air-launched ballistic missile, but at the time, this was huge news. In fact, this is now seen as the onset of the modern hypersonic arms race. And in the days immediately after this speech, as the world's media exchanged headlines about doomsday hypersonic missiles, Lockheed Martin quietly stripped their website of any mention of their hypersonic SR-72 program. First, they took down the SR-72 webpage that had been up for five years at that time. Then they redirected its URL to their press release page and scrubbed their press release database of any document that mentioned the program. As the word hypersonic became a Google trending topic and the world's media reported on how Russia had leapfrogged the US in hypersonic technology, 
Lockheed made sure that the hypersonic aircraft program they were bragging about just two months earlier would not show up in anybody's web searches. From March 2018 to this very day, you will not find a single mention of the SR-72 anywhere on Lockheed Martin's website. But we all know that this story does not end there. The program may have gone dark, but we still got hints. In 2021, the Air Force's Profession of Arms Center of Excellence released a video about the past and future of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft. And in this video, there's a split second clip of an uncrewed platform that looks just like the single engine SR-72 flight research vehicle Lockheed Martin said they could deliver by 2018. And if that's not quite convincing enough, if you slow down this footage and zoom into the area just above this aircraft's wing route and then increase the brightness as high as Adobe will allow, you can actually make out its designation. And its designation is SR-72. From there, this story went cold until 2022 when Top Gun Maverick flew into theaters with an unusual new aircraft in tow. According to the movie's script, this unusual aircraft called the Dark Star was a hypersonic technology demonstrator designed and built by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and powered by turbine-based combined cycle engines. But it wasn't just the script that said so. As I learned firsthand in my interview with the movie's producer Jerry Brockheimer and director Joseph Kaczynski, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works was directly involved in designing and building the full-scale replica aircraft that they used as a prop in the movie. And if you've been watching this channel since then, then you know that we right here broke the story that the result was so realistic that the Navy told Jerry Brockheimer that China reoriented spy satellites to get a better look at it. The Navy told us that the Chinese satellite turned and, and had a, a different route to photograph that plane. They thought it was real. That's how real it looks. Now, if you watched my video about why the U.S. would want a hypersonic spy plane in the first place, you already know that reorienting a spy satellite is no small matter. These massive and immensely expensive orbital assets carry limited fuel on board and cannot be refueled in orbit. And that means anytime a satellite is forced to burn fuel to adjust orbit or orientation, you are directly shortening the orbital lifespan of a multi-billion dollar asset. If Brockheimer's story is true, it seems very unlikely that China would sacrifice the lifespan of a spy satellite just to get a better look at a prop being made for a movie they were very well aware was in production. Remember that well before Top Gun hit theaters, it drew headlines because the movie's producers changed the patches on Maverick's jacket to appease the Chinese censors. Now, they did ultimately digitally change those patches back, but nonetheless, Top Gun Maverick was no secret to China. And while it's exceedingly unlikely that China would reorient a spy satellite to get a better look at a prop for a movie they knew was filming, it doesn't seem quite as crazy to think that they may have reoriented that satellite to get a better look at a platform that looked a lot like a real one, designed and built by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, that their intelligence apparatus had reason to believe was already in testing. And to be clear, that timeline adds up. Top Gun Maverick began filming in May 2018. That's eight months after witnesses first reported seeing an SR-72 demonstrator flying over Palmdale. Four months after Lockheed Martin executive Jack O'Banion said the aircraft was flying. And just two months after the program went dark. Now, as you almost certainly already know, Lockheed Martin was not shy about their involvement with the Dark Star for Top Gun Maverick once the movie was headed for theaters. In fact, I could argue that over the past two years, Lockheed Martin has consistently winked at us about the idea of a hypersonic aircraft in development. On March 12th, 2023, they tweeted an image of an SR-71 in a hangar, along with a caption that included the sentence, the SR-71 is still the fastest acknowledged crude air-breathing jet aircraft. And while their use of the word acknowledged may have seemed awfully intentional, things only got juicier from there. They then put out a press release that said, with the Skunk Works expertise in developing the fastest known aircraft, combined with a passion and energy for defining the future of aerospace, Dark Star's capabilities could be more than mere fiction. They could be reality. Now, they may not have mentioned the SR-72 by name there, but that's practically the same marketing copy they used for the SR-72 starting all the way back in 2013. 
In fact, Lockheed Martin even seemed to say the quiet part out loud with another quote that has since been removed from their website and Darkstar promotional materials. I'll quote it here. Darkstar may not be real, but its capabilities are. Hypersonic technology, or the ability to travel at 60 miles per minute or faster, is a capability our team continues to advance today by leveraging more than 30 years of hypersonic investments and development and testing experience. Now today, we know that Lockheed Martin's SR-72 is not the only hypersonic aircraft program to draw funds from Pentagon coffers. Last November, Hermes proved that their turbine-based combined cycle turbojet ramjet engine could successfully make the transition from turbojet to ramjet power in a high-speed wind tunnel. Proving this combined cycle engine concept works. A month later, in December, Leidos was awarded $334 million to continue development on the Air Force Research Lab's Mayhem program, which aims to field a hypersonic intelligent surveillance reconnaissance and strike platform powered by a turbine-based combined cycle engine. The cold hard truth of the fact is this. Hypersonic aircraft are coming. It's a capability the U.S. military has invested hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, into developing to date, and Lockheed Martin has a decade-plus head start on the competition. And that brings us full circle, all the way back to the recent comments made by Vago Maradian on his podcast about Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works already delivering test articles of a high-performance intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft that can far outperform even the high highly classified RQ-180, a system so forward-leaning that it needed to be rescoped before they built the second block of aircraft. Over the course of weeks of research and interviews, I've come to believe that those test articles that were already delivered were Lockheed Martin's single-engine F-22 Raptor-sized SR-72 flight research vehicles. And the Block 2 platforms he was referencing are the twin-engine operational aircraft, Lockheed said they could deliver by 2030. But the hard truth is, only time will tell if I'm right. And on that ends this special edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.